<laughs> Good evening and welcome to another Wednesday night Bible study uh, with me, your host and facilitator, Minister Mark Walters. So good to have everyone tonight. The sanctuary is packed. Um, and so good to see you here. And uh, we want to welcome all of you who are joining us via the live stream, who are joining us. Uh, if you can come to the sanctuary, by all means, come to the sanctuary. Uh, we just want to give on honor and to our pastor, Bishop Oliver Sobrian, First Lady, Sister Rose Sobrian, and all of you who are joining us and who join us week after week after week. Tonight we have an interesting lesson. I'm not going to be able to get through all of 1 Corinthians 7 tonight, but we'll get through the first part of it. And, um, and uh, we'll see how far we can get in the upcoming weeks. All right. All right. If you are here... Um, just want to bow your heads. Or if you're online, bow your heads. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we lift up your name. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We just want to worship you tonight, Father. We just want to glorify you. We want to magnify you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you, oh God, for just giving us health and strength and for giving us another uh, week's journey. You kept us in our right mind. You've blessed us. You've been with us. You've been our friend. You've been our Lord. You've been our God. We thank you tonight, Lord God, for your lesson that you've given us, Lord God. I pray, oh God, that you would increase and I would decrease, Lord God, that, that they would not hear from the wisdom of man, but that they would hear what thus saith the Lord. Go with us tonight. Give me wisdom. Give me anointing. Give me a special touch tonight, God, I pray, uh, to minister to your people, oh God. Help us tonight as we learn about your word uh, from 1 Corinthians 7. We bless you now. We lift you up now. Have your way, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. As I do every week, well, not every week. Some weeks I do something different. I do something different every single week. Um, so I shouldn't say like we did last week. But anyone remember anything we learned from last week's lesson? Anything? Quickly, quickly, we are live, we are live, we are live, okay, all right, we did not learn anything last week, I'm disappointed, um, but it won't be the last time I'll be disappointed, and it's not the first time, so let's press on. So Wednesday night Bible study is on the air, we're going to talk about 1 Corinthians 7, this is a little bit, this is the theme, this is the subject matter, which is a little bit more mature, so if you have, uh, if young people, if you're watching and you're under the age of um, 90, you probably shouldn't watch. Um, but um, actually, no, if you're under the age of maybe 18, 17, you should probably, uh, you're probably going to be smirking the whole time. So you should probably go play your video games right now. And, um, and those of you who are, uh, who are squeamish, um, then you, you might want to find something else to do. But if not, if you're still here, then by all means, stay and let's go into 1 Corinthians 7. It's a little, you know, st stuff. We'll see. Um, grown people stuff. So we'll see how it all works out tonight. Okay, everybody okay? Everybody okay? Yes? No? Okay, why are you guys so quiet? Don't be so quiet. All right, let's go. All right, so again, the background, 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians is written about 56 or 57 AD uh, when Paul was in Ephesus. And um, it's during the, the last three years um, when he's in Ephesus. He talks about Christian life and conduct. Um, the occasion for the writing was a letter of inquiry about certain doctrines. So that's, you find that in chapter 7, chapter 8. Um, well, so we find that in chapter 15 also because they asked him, about the resurrection also, so I gotta f update my chart. Um, and he answered a report from some brethren on the condition and different problems of the church. So the things that we saw in chapters five and six um, were conditions that um, the brethren had wrote to him about. They weren't questions, they were, he, wasn't, they were, he wasn't responding to questions. People had just written him letters and said, yo, Brother Paul, this is what's going on in the church, and blah, 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 blah. So Paul, you know, as the apostle to um, um, the Gentiles, and he, as he had preached, him and Apollos had preached out that church, he felt responsible to answer. So, all right, so the answer, so this letter, so this letter uh, in 1 Corinthians um, answers, um, it, actually, I want to break it out a little bit more. This part of the letter in chapter 7 answers the following questions about the unmarried, married, the unmarried, un, the married, unmarried, <laughs> circumcision, servitude, and virgins, okay? So that's what we're going to cover tonight, because this, it's, it goes into, it goes into a lot, so, but I'm going to talk tonight about the unmarried and the married, and un, 
unmarried and married. How about that? How about that? What do we have on the screen? Okay, that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to get through the last um, three because that's a, it's a big subject. So with, over the next couple of weeks, I know we have service all of next week, so we won't be having Bible study next week, but the week after that, we should be having um, Bible study. We will finish up. We'll talk about um, divorce, remarriage, all that kind of stuff, all the stuff that um, I got a lot of questions about. So I will be covering that. Tonight, we're going to be talking about um, sexuality in marriage. So if you're under 18, um, go uh, watch the PG-13 channel or the TV Youth 7 channel. All right, so let's go. All right. Now, concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. So again, Paul is, 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 is writing this. Now, concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to what? Touch a woman. All right. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own what? Husband. Okay, let's read that again. Now, concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. So again, so he's saying these are the things these are in the letter. You wrote me these questions. Now I'm getting ready to do what? Get ready to what? Answer the questions. All right. So he says, um, concern the things. So obviously one of the things they asked him was, should a man touch a woman? Can a man? I'm gonna, I'm just, we're going to explain what touching means, okay? Everybody understand? We're going to talk about what touching means. What does touching mean to you? What does touching mean? It's just a unique I'll quickly. What does touching mean to you, Sister Christine? If he says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Oh, you're so clean and so tidy. Sister Elizabeth, what does that mean for a man not to touch a woman? Okay, I like you. You are, you're from New York. Yes. All right. That's just like how it is. So that's what he means. So let's go. So nevertheless, to avoid fornication. So what does he say? Here, touch is used in the same sense of having sexual relationships. Uh, this was probably a statement made by the Corinthian Christians. We know the Corinthian Christians, which they asked Paul to agree with, um, with the statement, but with reservation. Paul and Paul agrees with it, but with reservation. That's what it nevertheless means in verse 2. Too. So it talks about here, um, they were asking him, they were, they were making a statement to him by saying, isn't it, good, isn't it good for a man not to have sex with a woman, right? Or in vice versa. So Paul says, uh, yeah, but, and then he goes on. So he's going to go into all the, all the, the nitty gritty. So why would the Corinthian Christians suggest complete celibacy, uh, which is what they meant by a man not to touch a woman? All right, what, is, what, are the, what do you think the Corinthian church meant when they wanted a man to have celibacy? And he's talking about even those, those that were married. Well, he was saying the Corinthian church was asking him, you know, after we talked about um, the things in chapter six, when the, the, he, he was discussing all the issues with fornication, all those things that was going on in chapter six and sexual um, sex and all those things in the church. So then the, the Corinthian church was was wondering if it was not better to be celibate, even in marriage. So that's what Paul is answering here. So let's go on to what he says. This is what the Corinthian church, the stuff in green. They probably figured that if sexual immorality was such a danger, then one could be more pure by abstaining from sex altogether, even in marriage. So what they believe, what the Corinthian church um, was believing was that, hey, you are more pure if you are, uh, if you are celibate than if you are having um, intimacy uh, in marriage. So this is what um, uh, Professor Hodge says. The idea that marriage was, less, was a less holy state than celibacy naturally led to the conclusion that married persons ought to separate. And it soon came to be regarded as an evidence of eminent um, spirituality when such a separation was final. So, um, so what they believed was that um, in order for me to be closer to God, um, I, I have to practice celibacy, and it even, even to the point where I have to get rid of my wife, because that's how much devotion I want to have to God. That's what Paul is dealing with in there. Okay, everybody okay so far? You understand? You with me? Okay, because this is a, a little bit of a journey tonight. So, 
not every, so his Paul's advice is not every man or woman is required to be married. So not every man or woman is required to be married, but those who choose to be are permitted by Christianity. So Christianity does not make any kind of, um, uh, what's the word, Bar um, block blockages or barriers to marriage. If you are a Christian, and you're a man, you should get married to a woman. If you're a woman, you should get married to a man. If you're a Christian, the gospel, the gospel does not interpose any hindrance to marriage in a normal creative relationship. And I say that because there are some people who believe um, erroneously that if you're a Christian, you should not get married. And you, there are actually people who believe that. You should stay um, single, and I'm going to show you where they kind of get that um, doctrine from. Okay. Everybody good so far? Yes, no? Okay, so slow me down because I'm going to go a little bit fast. Uh, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Due benevolence. I miss my reader. Um, and likewise, also the wife unto the husband. Okay. Somebody else can read. Can somebody else read for me? And let me just, um, just kind of cycle through. Okay, let's go. Verse 3. Verse 3 or yep. 4. Verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and, also, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud he not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that they that he may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt ye not for your incon incontinency. incontinency. Okay. But I speak this by permission and not of command. All right, stop there. Okay, let's go back and read it again. All right. Let the husband render unto the wife um, do benevolence, right? And likewise also the wife unto the husband. Um, the wife does not have power of, over her body, but the husband does. And, and the husband does not have power over his body, but his wife does. Um, defraud, or defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan does not tempt you for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission and not of a commandment. Okay, so what does Paul mean by this? What does Paul mean by this? Anybody, what does Paul mean by this? Come on, um, what's your name again? I keep forgetting your name. Camille, Camille, what do you think by Paul means when he talks about this? Use the mic right there, sweetheart. Yes, you have to, because we're online and people can't hear you. People have to hear your answer. Well, then they have to hear you loud and wrong. <laughs> so let's go. <laughs> what do you think he means? Like verse six. Give me a, give me a your 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 thoughts on verse um, verse three. Actually, let's start with three. The one that's up there. No, let's start with verse three. Which one was verse three? Again? Okay, we're going back to here. I have no idea what that part means, but I know what the part after it means. Okay, thank you. That's 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 good. Let me hear Unique. Thank you, uh, Camille. It means to be kind and and you know, kind of just like when he talks about in the Bible about um. Uh, let's see how I want to say this. Like if if someone's hungry, feed them. If yes. they're thirsty you know, give them drink. So, so if your husband's thirsty, give him f water. In that kind of sense, yes. I don't want to say. <laughs> don't get me to say that on the air. <laughs> All right, I understand. Let me hear um, Sister, um, brother, brother Gopi and Sister Christine. Brother Gopi, let me hear you. What, um, Verse three. Verse. I think, I think he means honor. And honor. The husband honor his wife, and, and the wife honor the husband. Okay. Sister Christine, what, is, what do you think that means? And let's read it in context with three and four. Brother Gopi, I kind of let, left you out of that. You should have read four, too, because three goes with four. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal 
right. <laughs> <laughs> I like this group. They have so many different names. And likewise, the, the wife to her husband. <laughs> okay. For well, the wife does not have exclusive or authority over her body. Once, they are, once you're married, you're now one. So you're no longer 100% yours. Your body does not belong to you alone. 100%. Neither okay, what percentage? What, what percentage? Is it 10%, 15%? Uh, what, what percentage? You said it's not 100%. Well, you don't have your way anymore. Okay. You know, but um, with compromising, you um, satisfy your husband, likewise, a husband, the wife. All right. Um, let me see. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Very good. Very good. Um, so, Carol Williams, Dorcas says, you know, good evening. Carol says, good evening. Um, Wayne B. says it means they both need to serve each other so they won't have to look outside of the marriage. Um, Brother Wayne, I miss you here. Um, Sister Carol says, husband and wife must love one another with a genuine love. And then, um, that's it. And Shelly J. says, fulfill the sexual needs of each other. All right. Sister Shelly J. All right, so let's go on here. All right, so let's go. All right, so let the husband render to his wife the affection, benevolence. So King James says benevolence. Um, NIV says affection. I think it's more, uh, we would more understand the word affection. You would understand affection, right, um, Sister Camille? I know what benevolence means. I just didn't understand benevolence. In that context. Yeah. So he said, let the husband render to his wife the affection um, do her. Instead of, a man, instead of a man not to touch a woman, within marriage, a husband must render to his wife the affection due her. So it is wrong for him to withhold affection from his wife, is what Paul is saying. So you must, you must render affection to your wife. If you're married, we're going to get into what affection means. Um, so affection, affection is to be given to your, to your spouse. Um, so you're, if you have a husband, you have to give your husband affection. Right, and that's the that's a that that's a requirement in marriage. So let me just say this plainly: if you can't give affection, and we're gonna get into what affection means in a second. If you can't give affection to your husband, you probably should not get married. So all the issues that you have outside of marriage when you are um, uh, single, if you have issues in sexuality, you you've got all. Issues. Some people have been a lot of trauma attached to, to sexuality because people have been molested, raped, all kinds of all kinds of hideous things. So you have a lot of um, trauma with it. So I think those things have to be resolved so that you can have a proper um, proper view of affection and sexuality in a Christian marriage. You have to have that right. So that what he says here is. Um, in terms of affection, it means that affection means literally um, affection, tenderness, and also that comes along with that is Sister Christine's word is conjugality. So let me use that word so it goes over the heads of the 13-year-olds who are sitting here watching. All right. So, so it means both things. It means that you have, you have romantic love. I got you, Sister Camille. So romantic love, and you have to have conjugal love with your husband, okay? Those two things are non-negotiable, and they are required in marriage. My, my readers here, go ahead, Sister Camille. Yes. Oh, you would know. You would know. Um, you would know. You, you have to know yourself. One of the key things about getting married is that you first have to know yourself. Before you get married, you have to spend a lot of time understanding your own self. And it's all these areas in your life you have to understand. Um, no one knows you better than you. That's right. You will be married for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and no one will still will know you better than you know yourself. So even when you are single, by yourself, whatever, that's the time to really take to get to know yourself and know these areas because you know what you've gone through. And you know your views on sexuality. You know your views on men. You know your views on women. You know all these, you know all these things because you formulated them inside of your own head based on your experiences. All right, so... So when you get married, you have to have, you have had to, or you should have, have resolved all those issues because these are some of the requirements which you have when you are a wife. So we'll do that. So the husband, first of all, let's go with the husband. So the husband has to give his wife what? 
Affection. So if your wife desires affection, guess what you have to do? You have to give her, <laughs> Sister Christine is smiling. You have to give her affection. Okay, that's, what's, that's the requirement. If she requires a conjugal visit, guess what you have to do? You have to give her a conjugal visit, okay? Within a marriage, you cannot withhold affection from your wife as a man. The affection due her is an important phrase. Since Paul meant this to apply to every Christian marriage, it shows that every wife has affection due her. So every single wife that you are, every single Christian wife is due affection both touching and also, let's just say, sexual. Paul doesn't think only the young are pretty. So it's not only when your wife is young or pretty or submissive or all that. It's not that. That's not, that's not when, only when she's due affection. Every wife is due affection because she's the wife of a Christian man. I'm talking to the men here. So every wife is due affection Every single wife is due affection if you're a Christian man because she's married to a Christian man, okay? Every wife, I'm sorry to single you out, Brother Howard, but I'm sure there's some online. So let me, Brother Wayne, online, your wife is due affection because she's the wife of a Christian man. All right, so, <laughs> all right, so everybody good so far? I haven't lost anybody. I probably gained some more people in the audience. All right, so let's go. Paul also emphasizes what the woman needs. It's not merely sexual relations, but the affection due her. So it's not just you just want to have sex with your wife. Um, so you just do whatever you, you, you can do. It has to be true. You have to give her true affection and true love. If a husband has sexual relationship with his wife, but without true affection to her, he is not giving his wife what she is due. It has to be true. So you can't just do stuff because you want stuff. You can't do stuff because you what? Want stuff. You have to have true affection for your wife. This is one of the areas in marriages, Christian marriages, that cause a lot of, a lot of problems. And people are, people, you see people come in to marriage counseling, things like that, and they have areas and they have issues in this area of their life because everything sort of culminates in this area of your life. You, you can't get along outside. You can't get along with the bills, the finance, the, the children, the this, the that, the whatever. It all seems to just pile up right in this area and it, and it, and it manifests itself in this area. And to me, this is the easiest area of your marriage to work out. This is the easiest area. And if this area you got problems with, that means... The whole of it got issues. Because this is the easy part. It's not the hard part. This is the easy part. This should be the easy part. But this is representative. This is representative of all that is going on inside of a relationship. If you cannot have affection, there's other things going on that you need to work out. But you have to get to the point where there is true affection one for another. Okay? Amen? All right. This is a little... This is a little tougher discussion. Affection also reminds us that when a couple is unable for physical or other reasons to have a complete sexual relationship, they can still have an affectionate relationship and thus fulfill God's purpose for these commands. So there will come a time maybe in your life when maybe you can't do what you used to do, and, um, but you can still have affection for your spouse and you can still have a loving, caring relationship for your spouse. This is a commandment. This is a requirement of a Christian man. So I'm going to talk to the men for a second. All right. So let's talk. Men, you okay? Brother Wayne is okay. I'm not going to single out Brother Howard because he's so faithful enough to show up tonight. Amen. Praise God. All right. And likewise, also the wife to her husband. So now I've got a, the ladies to deal with here. On the same idea, also the wife to her husband, the wife is not to withhold marital affection from her husband. Again, the wife is not to withhold marital affection from her husband. If you got a husband, that is part of the marriage contract. You have to have relationship with your husband 
um, whenever, <laughs> whenever it is required. Um, the, Paul strongly puts forth the idea that there is mutual sexual responsibility in marriage. So within a marriage, there is mutual, both of you owe each other to be okay and open with your sexuality. The husband has obligations towards his wife and the wife has obligations towards her husband. It is a mutual thing. The wife's bot is like Sister um, Christine so adequately said, the wife's body does not belong to her. The husband's body does not belong to him. They have to come together and have sexual relationships with each other when each other requires it or wants it or whatever the case is uh, might be. That's the idea that Paul is putting forth. Um, so the emphasis, so he says render to his wife. So when we talk about that, render to his wife, do benevolence. The emphasis is on giving, on I owe you instead of you owe me. So remember that is the emphasis is on this is what I owe you. Um, instead of, you know, you demanding from your wife, you owe me this. It's this is what I owe you in, in fulfilling my portion, my half, if you, ha if you may, if you will, of the marriage contract that we have. In God's heart, sex is put on a much higher level than merely the husband's privilege and the wife's duty. It is something that both of you owe each other. So in God, the way God sees it is that God doesn't see it as you know, the wife has his duty and the husband has his privilege. God sees it as a way for two people to become what we talked about last time, to become as what? One. This is what God said. This is, this is what is, unfortunately, what's happened in our culture is, well, I'll get to it later. I'm not there yet. I'm going to get ahead of myself. The wife does not have authority over her own body. In fact, these obligations are so concrete, it could be said that the wife's body does not even belong to herself, but to her husband. So your body, <laughs> Camille, you're not married, right? So one day you'll get married, and guess what? Whose body will, your body will become whose? That's a very optimistic <laughs> Your husband, right? Your husband will own your body, and you will own his body. So... Um, so that means you should take care of your husband's body <laughs> because you now, you now have someone else's body to be responsible for. So that means buy lotion, buy perfumes, um, take care of it, buy good clothes, whatever, because it's you now own, you have now inherited a body. So you have to take care of this body, all right? And the wife is the same thing. You have now, you have now um, inherited a body and you have to take care of this body. The same principle is true of the husband husband's body in regard to his wife. So it is a mutual thing. The way God sets it up, it's a mutual thing. And I know we don't talk about these things in church, but um, you see the effects of it in church. You see the effects of it. You see people who have issues with one another. You see, you see it played out all over the place. And if you really spend some time and you talk to people, you will begin to see that there are a lot of issues in this area. And so I don't have any problems with talking about it. And I and I just think the church needs to be very open about it and address it because it's part of being married. It's part of being a Christian. It's in, it's in the Bible. <laughs> so we have to discuss it. And the Bible does not leave this out. It's an important area of all of our lives. And we can't just overlook it. And we have to understand what the Bible says about it. And we cannot go by what the world um, teaches us about sexuality. We cannot go by what the world um, teaches us about sexuality. Any questions so far? Unique. You bring the mic to your mouth as though you're going to ask a question. Go ahead and ask your question. It's not necessarily a question. I just need you to go over the part where it's with permission. Okay. That's where I think a lot of people get into situations because people... Where he says, I speak by permission? Yeah. I'm getting to that idea. Oh. I'm getting to that. Okay, I'll get to that. Hi, Sister Elizabeth. Good to have you. Sister Judy, I'm sorry. Sister Elizabeth's on the left side. Sister Judy. All right. So, okay. So here, to summarize again, the wife does not have authority over her own body. Um, it's these obligations um, are the wife. Let me just say it quickly. Again, the wife's body belongs to who? Her husband. And the husband's body belongs to who? The neighbors, no, just kidding, the wife, <laughs> so the wife, <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> All right, y'all just, y'all have no sense of humor. Okay, it's the wife, so we have to, again, like I said, you cannot, you cannot take, um, you cannot take the world's view of this uh, marriage. Marriage, you, you cannot look at the, I'm going to get to what the, how the world looks at marriage here a little bit later in my, in my discussion here. This does not justi justify, so let me just quickly clear some things up. A husband abusing or coercing his wife sexually or otherwise. Man, you do not, you cannot sexually um, coer coerce, coerce your wife into having relationships with you. Let me just say that. That is not showing affection and do benevolence. That's what the word, benevolence means kindness. So that's not, that would not be being kind to each other. Um, Paul's point is that we have a binding obligation to serve our partner with physical affection. It is an awesome obligation out of, and this is what, this is what one writer, this is um, a commentator said, it's an awesome obligation out of the billions of people off, on the earth, God has chosen one and one alone to meet our sexual needs. I cannot um, overstate that. You have one husband, you have one wife, and uh, you have one husband, and you have one wife. Let me say it again. You have one husband, and you have one wife. And so you have no opportunity to do anything else for anybody else. And so if that person is not doing what he or she is supposed to do, it causes lots and lots and lots and lots of issues because you got only what? You only got, you can only get milk from one store. <laughs> and if the store is closed, guess what? You're in trouble. <laughs> what you say? No, 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 sister, sister. That's I'm not gonna mix up sister Elizabeth, sister Judy, <laughs> sister Judy, sister Judy says you go. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, God. Sister Heather says, a well, Sister Shelly says, amen. Um, Sister Heather says, if the woman is tired, that would be a no. Sister Shelly says, amen. Um, pedicures and manicures, that's what I said. <laughs> Somebody else uh, owns Brother Wayne, give you a thumbs up. The church has a responsibility to speak about these things, what Sister Shelly said. Uh, Sister Heather says, my body belongs to me and and his body belongs to him. I don't understand. Okay, Sister Heather needs <laughs> needs some some talking. All right. So so all right. Everybody okay so far? Okay. So we got to understand. This is what God desires for people in marriage, and this is how God's view, Sister Judy, of marriage is. All right. There is to be what no one else, no one else. <laughs> and, I love this class. All right, so Paul goes on, do not deprive one another. This is the word I'm, gonna, I'm using. He says do not defraud. Defraud and de deprive is the word that is, that is used there. So Paul rejects their idea that husband and wife could be more holy by sexual abstinence. He says don't deprive one another. In fact, harm can come when you deprive one another as you open the door to the devil so that he says, don't deprive one another so that you don't open the door to the devil to allow the devil to tempt you. Uh, the word for deprive is the same as defraud in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 8. So when we deny physical affection and section, sexual intimacy to our spouse, we are cheating them. So let me say it again. When you deny physical affection and sexual, sexual intimacy to your spouse, you're doing what? You're doing what? You're cheating them. You're cheating them. So he says, don't cheat one another. In other words, don't cheat one another. It's not, he didn't say, don't cheat on one another, because you already know you can't cheat on one another. But he says, don't cheat each other. So don't cheat each other. Um, Paul, again, he rejects the idea that husband and wife could be more holy by sexual absence. There are some people who are married that believe that you should be abstinent. You should not, we'll get to it, and we'll get to it on the next chart. 
Do not deprive. Sexual deprivation marriage has not only to do with frequency, but also with romance. This is why Paul tells husband to render to his wife the affection due her. The deprivation either sense gives occasion for the deprived, Sister Judy, to look elsewhere and at the, in the other store um, for fulfillment and to destroy the marriage. Okay? So when you deprive your husband, you are giving that person the opportunity to look elsewhere. He's not saying that he should. When you deprive your wife, you are giving that lady the opportunity to look elsewhere. Uh, I like the way Sister Judy put it. You look in another fridge to get milk. Okay, so um, that's what we're, we're, we're not to do. See, so he said, do not deprive. Sexual deprivation marriage has not only to do, so if you are, if you are not frequent, that's also deprivation, um, but you, 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 you should not also, as a man or as a woman, withhold um, romance, um, affection, touching, kindness, whatever your spouse, however your spouse, spouse likes it. Maybe your spouse likes you to bring home flowers every, every other week, so that's what you do. Whatever it takes to, to build and to keep affectionate romance. And what has to happen in relationships is people have to talk about these things. But what happens a lot of times, we don't talk about it, we just build up anger and resentment because we have what we call, what I always say, like whenever I, I counsel people, one of the worst things in marriage is to have uncommunicated expectations. So you expect something from someone, but you never told the person. And so you expect, and a lot of our uncommunicated expectations comes from uh, how we're raised. So you come into a marriage with an expectation, uh, like for instance, simple example, like for instance, in most families, um, you might expect the man to cut the grass in the summer, in the springtime. When does grass grow? Springtime? So you might expect the man to cut the grass in the springtime, but the man, <laughs> that's not how he grew up. <laughs> he just grew up sitting inside and maybe somebody came to cut the grass. And so now the wife, she never told him that's her expectation. But so now springtime comes, the grass is, you know, a foot high um, and the grass not cut. And then she's acting a certain way. She's upset. She's whatever, getting acted somewhere. Not telling him why, because, you know, we do a lot of the, the silent, um, silent treatment stuff. Um, and we're not saying anything, but we're upset because we had what? We had an uncommunicated expectation. When you are married, you have to, you have to understand, and this is, not a, this is not a marriage class, but let me just give a little, a, little, a little quick tidbit here. When you're married, if you understand that you're married for life and that you can, you, your spouse is not going to run for the exit if you just tell that person, you know, this is what I expect or this is what is going on inside, the spouse should not be running for the exit, exit because they didn't like something that you said. You ought to be able to speak calmly and reasonably about anything that's going on inside your relationship because you're going to be with each other for the rest of your life. Okay, till death do us what? So, okay, all right, everybody okay so far? So you have to, deprivation gives occasion for the deprived to look elsewhere for fulfillment and to destroy a marriage, amen. Uh, sister, somebody, Brother Earl says, marriage is until death. Sister Brianna Brown said, amen. I'm not sure to what point, all right, all right. All right, so Paul said, this is the part where Sister, um, uh, Sister Unique was asking. I say this as a concession. That's what he means by permission. I say this as a concession. God will permit, reluctantly as a concession, a married couple. This is what he means by speaking as permission. So it's really a, con a concession that God allows married people to abstain from sexual relationships for a short time only for the sake of fasting and prayer. It's only for one thing. I'm coming to you, Sister Camille. Uh, so there's one thing, only for the sake of fasting and prayer. That's it. You, don't have, you can't say, well, I don't want to have sex because I have a headache. <laughs> Let me just stop. Just kidding. I don't know. But <laughs> there are some things. If you love your wife, you will understand all these things that go on. Go on, Sister Camille. Ask your question. Use the mic, sweetheart. Microphone. Don't be so upset with using the mic. You have to use the mic. We are live. We are streaming. We are seen in hundreds of countries. They have to hear your question. Shouldn't God want us to like 
fast and pray yes. and like devote ourselves to him so why is it reluctantly um because when you're married there is a different there is now um, um thank you for asking that question so just camille's question is shouldn't god want us to fast and pray um uh, shouldn't God want us to fast and pray? And so why is this given reluctantly? It is given reluctantly in the sense that um, the relationship between a man and a woman, God ordained that. So that's also something that he ordained. It's not just our relationship isn't with God only vertically. It's also horizontal. So God sees that too. And God honors that because God is the one who did what? God did what? He instituted marriage and he instituted sex in marriage. That's what God did. So God is pleased when men and women are sexual with each other in a marriage setting. So that is, that is also pleasing to God. So, but so he says, he says that um, since these commands um, for a man and a woman are to not, re, not restrain themselves from one another, um, God reluctantly, <laughs> as a concession, allows couples to, if you, if you want to seek God in prayer and fasting, with, with the mutual consent um, for time, then after that you have to come back together. So that's what he says. It is um, not as a commandment. God does not command or even recommend abstaining from sex within a marriage. God does not command or recommend that. Um, but it can be done for a brief time for a specific spiritual reason. This is what this is what is not taught. Um, that's why people have issues. <laughs> so you have to teach it. But if this concession is used, it is only to be used for a time, and then the husband and wife must come together again in a sexual sense. So let me say. It. The principle in this passage is important. God makes it clear that there's nothing wrong and everything right about sex and marriage. And I'm not spending a lot of time on this, but I spent time on this because I've gotten questions about this. And I'm just like Paul, I'm answering the questions. And I think it's important. Um, Satan's great strategy. This is what I, I believe is happening. Satan's great strategy when it comes to sex is to do everything he can to encourage sex outside of marriage. All you got to do is turn on the TV. Everybody is doing whatever they're doing. Not a one of them is married. And so, so um, and he discourages sex within marriage. And it's so, and foolishly, the church itself discourages sex in marriage. Um, it's Satan's goal to, whatever God does, it's Satan's goal to undo it. So if you want to know what to do in marriage, just do every, everything opposite what the world does. The world glorifies sex outside of marriage. That's all you see. And if you ever see couples on TV that are married, their lives are so boring and they have no sexual energy. There's no excitement. It seems like the only people that have fun are the ones that are cheating on their spouses and the ones that are running around from this person to that person and sleeping in this house, that whatever. That is not what God intended. That is not what God intended. So if that's what the devil's strategy, if that's what the devil is showing you, you know it's wrong. And you know that God must want the opposite. It's Satan's great strategy. I'm going to read it again. When it comes to sex, it's to do everything he can do to encourage sex outside of marriage. Every Thing that you see and read and literature and everything and movies and shows and books and all of it is beautiful when it's outside of marriage. As soon as they get married, you either hear nothing about it or it's boring or it's this. And the only time it's exciting is when, like my good friend said, they go look into another refrigerator. That's the only time it's exciting. And so, but that's what, that's what the world uh, wants you to um, believe. But God designed it. God ordained it. And I like this is a Camille's question. Um, but it is God who ordained it. God who, who designed it. And it is important in a Christian marriage for it to be enjoyable, to be fun, to be passionate, and for it to continue. It is an equal victory for Satan if he accomplishes either plan. It is a victory for Satan if he encourages it outside of marriages and discourages it inside of marriage. It is a victory for Satan if he can stop you from having relationships with your spouse in your marriage. And it's a victory for him if he can encourage you to have relationships outside of marriage. Marriage. Anybody want to comment?
<laughs> I like Sister Shelley's question. What is considered a short time? Can a spouse fast for 40 days? Um, can a spouse fast for 40 days? Answer that question, because we just went over that. Yes. Yes, go ahead, answer the question. They can, as long as they mutually agree. Thank you. Sister Unique, Sister Unique. So as long as, so Sister Shelley, your answer is, as long as they both um, agree, um, as long as they both agree, they can do, they can fast for a year, they can fast for an hour, they can fast for a day, they can fast for 40 days, as long as they both agree. The key thing is there that they both have to agree. It, aren't these just very simple, common sense kinds of things? Um, because when you're married, you're all for one and one for all. That's, that's what marriage is, is supposed to be. All right, so let's go. And I think we're getting close to the end of this section. Um, this can be seen in the way some of the Corinthians Christians thought it was just fine to hire the services of a prostitute. And other Corinthians Christians thought it was more spiritual for a husband and wife to never have sexual relationships. And that's in, that's in, in response to here. Uh, is the equal victory for Satan if he accomplishes either plan? So what the Corinthian church, so you remember what we talked about last time, what the Corinthian church was they, they use your wife for what? having babies and use your concubine for what? Satisfying your body and then your harlots was used for what? Just doing freaky stuff. Whatever you felt like doing, that's what the harlot was for. So that's what, that's what the Corinthian church believed. And they, and they accepted it in the church. It was like, it was like no big deal. So Paul, had, throughout these first five or six chapters, he's trying to clean all that stuff up and give them clear and concise instructions on what to do. Go ahead, Sister Camille, ask, use your mic, sweetheart. Mic, mic, mic. So um, you probably covered this at some point in time, mm -hmm. but like, let's just say I was in Bible study. Yes. And it was, you were one of these Corinthian people <laughs> <laughs> and I thought you like knew everything and I trusted you and you were like, you know, when you get married, you shouldn't have sexual relations. Yes. And I believe that that's what God wanted. Mm -hmm. And then when I get married, I don't have sexual relations because I think that's what God wants. Is he going to be mad about it? Is he going to what? Is he going to be mad about it? <laughs> well, your husband might be mad about it. <laughs> All right, so that's a, that's a very good question. That's an innocent question. That's a good question. Um, and that's why, that's why it's so important to... Um, um, to understand, number one, to read the Bible for yourself and understand the Bible. And understand, that's number one, you have to understand the Bible. Two, I believe that in everything, if you d diligently seek God and ask God for an answer, God will give you the answer. God will put people in your life that will give you the answer to your question. Um, so if you, and thirdly, if you, if you have those issues, let's say you, you believe that, and then you got married, right? And then you see this is, you're having all these problems in your marriage or whatever, whatever, because that would cause problems in your marriage. Um, then that's something you go and you meet with your, your pastors, your leaders, whatever, whatever, and then that's the kind of, that's, that's how you get in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. Uh, in the mouth of counsel, there's safety, so you'd have people that, that could minister to you and explain to you scripture and teach you and things like that. And that's why God puts you in places like this so you can learn and understand and hopefully not get erroneous doctrine. Does that make sense? Um, God does not, God can't judge you for something that you didn't know about, right? So if you're completing the time of your ignorance, God winked. In other words, God did not even look at what's going on. So you're ignorant. And so God, you, you can only, you can only, you can only um, uh, walk in the amount of light that's revealed to you, right? You can only walk in the light that's given to you. Your path can only be as illuminated as the light that's given to you. So God can't judge you for that. Okay? Answer your question? Okay. You have another question. Okay. You want to ask what? Yeah, of course, I'm sure. I'm 100% sure. <laughs> I like Camille. All right. All right, anybody, anybody else? Questions, thoughts? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. All right, so a Christian husband, and we're gonna end with this section. This is gonna be a 
this lesson is going to end at very shortly because we're going to end with verse 9. A Christian husband and wife must not accept a poor sexual relationship. Let me say that again. A Christian husband and wife must not accept a poor sexual relationship. Um, the problems may not be easily overcome or quickly solved, but God wants every Christian marriage to enjoy a sexual relationship that is a genuine blessing instead of a burden or a curse. A Christian husband and wife must not accept a poor sexual relationship. Um, again, your problems may not be easily overcome or quickly solved, um, but God wants every Christian marriage to enjoy a sexual relationship that is a genuine blessing instead of a burden or a curse. Um, I'll say it one more time. A Christian husband and wife must not accept a poor sexual relationship. The problems, you may have problems in your relationship where this area is concerned. Um, they may not be easily overcome. They may not be quickly solve, but God wants every Christian marriage to enjoy a fulfilling sexual relationship um, that is indeed a blessing and not a burden or a curse. All right. All right. Amen. It is good. For, Sister Shelley says it is good for the mind and the body. Okay. Questions? Please use your mic. Somebody online may want to hear your question because they probably have the exact same question. No, I'm just saying, in other words, you need to work on it. You have to work on it. You know, it's not just saying it's... It's not going to happen tonight. Right. So you need right. to work on it. It takes time. But the, the idea is that you, you have to be working towards it. And there has to be openness and there has to be communication. There has to be discussion um, where these areas are concerned. I realize some of this stuff is new to people and some of this stuff is probably an eye opener. Um, but I want you to go back through your own scripture and read it yourself and, and see if that's not what um, Paul is really saying or what God is saying. All scripture is given, all scripture is given by inspiration. Um, so even what, even what Paul is saying is what God has given Paul to say. Um, and so that's what he is um, saying and that's what he is um, meaning for uh, Christian relationships as it relates to um, sexuality in a Christian marriage. Okay. All right, sister. All right, everybody good? So we're going to end at nine. Unless there are other things, because we only can get through seven, eight, seven, eight, nine. Sister Harding, can you read seven, eight, nine? Sister Harding, give her the mic, please. You've got mics coming at you from every direction, but you refuse to take any one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Verse seven: For I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, and another after that. Mm -hmm. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. All right, let's hear um, thoughts on that part. Let's go back to 7, 8, 9. Um, for I would, that all men were even. Let's get, um, let's hear the, uh, the only man in the audience besides myself, Brother Howard. Let me hear your thoughts on verse 7, 8, 9. Was, was Paul married at any time? Paul was not married. Never. Okay. Because he has a lot of insight. Yes, he does. Because he's that's not married. So he well, be he, inspired by God. It's not that you, when you're hearing from God, God is the one that's inspiring him to write and to speak. So he's speaking as God has given him utterance. So it's not necessarily just his own personal viewpoints. This is what God has given in all scriptures, given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, that, that the man of God might be fully equipped. Let's go. But that was, that was my point. That's your point. That's not, that's not answering no, my question. No, my question my is point. on verse 7, 8, 9. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, hmm. um, uh, you're taking too long, yeah. and we are online, and we are being watched by 100 other countries. All right, let's go. Sister Judy, verse 7, 8, 9. Give Sister Judy a mic. 
Sister Judy, for I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. Well, he's saying that he wished that all men would be like him. Like him how? Like whom what? By him, like himself, not Mary's. Yes. But if you, if you can, uh -huh. it's better to, to marry. Okay. He's saying it's better to marry than to burn. Than to burn? What do you mean? What does it mean by that? Go to hell. Oh, no. <laughs> I like Sister Judy. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll hold on. We'll hold on to that one. That's Sister Judy's position on it. Um, Sister Unique, what do you think he's meaning by that? <laughs> I love it. I'm coming back to you, Brother Howard. You did not get off the hook. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. I'm, he just think that men should, you know, um, abstain from being married, but if desire overcomes someone, <laughs> then it's better to be married mm -hmm. so that you're not having, what would I say, like lustful situations. Okay, that. so you think that, you saying that, he's he is saying that um, it is... I want you, sister, you and just sister Judy agree with this part that I want everybody to be basically single and celibate. But in order for you to, um, if you, I feel like you're having a lot of strong. But if you're, if you're gonna sin against God, basically, uh -huh. if you're gonna if you're gonna commit a sin during this, it's better to just get married so that you're not caught up in in your sinful nature. Okay, all right, like that, um, brother Howard. Would you would you um, What's the word? What's the word I'm looking for? I'm looking for a word. Would you, um, I was check, check that. Would you agree with that? Would you, would you, I'm, there's a word I'm looking for. It's an SAT word, but I can't, it can't, doesn't come to me. Would you agree with that? With the so, sister so Judy what, and sister what, Unique said. What she's saying is that, that you should get married so that you won't do things outside of, do things that would be, I guess, harmful. Right. Harmful. harmful. I don't think she used the word harmful. No. I have I have an issue with that. Okay. Well, the, first of all, I'm, did, would you would you sign off on what they both no, said? No, I don't. You wouldn't sign off on it. Let me hear your. Let me hear why you wouldn't sign off on it. Because to, if, if for example, like if I wanted to rob the bank and say, oh, that's bad to rob the bank. So I say, you know what? I'm gonna go work for the bank and then rob them. No, because I'm inside the bank now. You know what I'm saying? To go to work for the bank and then steal the money. Rather okay. Than, then just go and rob them. I'm confused. Okay. Um, you, I, I missed the whole bank okay. analogy thing. I'm, now we're robbing banks. I like that <laughs> idea, though. No. But let's, let's kind of, I like that idea, but let's see. It's just basically let's, if you, if you let me, no, let me Let me just hear Brother Howard, because let me give him a chance to clear it up. What were you saying? I'm sorry, I kind of missed it because I was looking at some of the comments. But I want to hear what you say it again. And, and give me, get me to the point where I'm robbing a bank. I want to understand that. No, I'm <laughs> saying, like, if you wanted, if you had thoughts of doing something yes right but it's not going to be good thoughts so for instance to rob the bank so he said no i don't want to rob the bank that's bad so what i'll do is get a job in the bank yes and then take the money then i'll rob the bank <laughs> okay okay huh which is the equivalent of that yes i think what you're saying is what? you're saying is i'm having a hard time i'm gonna let sister christine answer for the um the howard gopi family <laughs> Go ahead, Christy. Paul was saying that he has no desire to be married. He yes. wished everyone was or is like him not to want to get married. Yes. However, mm -hmm. uh, you have different gifts. Some want to be married. Yep. And he said, if you want to be married, then go ahead and be married because uh, you won't be lusting or committing fornication or adultery mm -hmm. because that would put you in trouble with God's ordinances. Okay. But if you cannot live single, then mm -hmm. go ahead and get married. That's the burden it's Yes, talking so about. please um, square that with robbing the bank. I want to understand those two. I didn't understand that analogy either. <laughs> So I need, I need y'all to work that one out when you get home. I get, on the way home, I want y'all to understand that and then send me a text. 
because I'm oh. struggling with it. He wants to redeem him. Okay. <laughs> Come on, Valero. This is your time. <laughs> I, I, I don't think <laughs> too deep. All right, that's the, let me come on this side, Sister Olive. What do you think? Just all you guys are taking too long with the mics. We're live in a hundred countries. So, I think that Paul is saying that you should be content in your singleness. Okay, like he is. Right? Yes. Um, but similar to what Sister Christine just said. Mm -hmm that if you are not able to be content in mm -hmm. being single mm -hmm. and you find yourself with desires mm -hmm. for, for the other person, then you should go ahead and get married because singleness is, or, or abstinence is a, a gift, like Christine said, and being married is a gift, Is right? it singleness a gift or is singleness just a state that you are in as you I are think transitioning through life. Being single mm -hmm. is probably the gift. Okay, is it singleness or is it celibacy that Paul is talking about? Let's not confuse the I two. I think it's celibacy. It's celibacy, okay. Yes. So, because um, you can be single and, and doing other things. Right. We get that. Right. So, so is it celibacy that he's talking about when he says here in nine, in, in seven, for I would that all men were even as myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God. Is that celibacy gift or is that single gift? Because single and celibacy, the celibacy gift. are separate entities. Celibacy. Okay. One after this manner and another. So you would think that celibacy is a gift. Yes. So if you can be celibate, that's a gift. And yes. so a celibate person that has it as a gift from God does not have the strong sexual desires. Right? Because am I right or am I wrong? I believe you are correct. Okay. So if it's However, a gift, go ahead, go ahead. I think you are correct. Mm -hmm. I think, though, that even somebody who is celibate yes. may have those desires, yes. but can keep them in check. Can, keep, can control them, correct. can maintain them. Because it's him, a gift. Him or because he gives you the will to maintain your gift. Got it. Okay, good. All right. So I'm glad we kind of cleared that up. And then let's get to this last part here. So he says here, um, thank you, Brother Howard, Sister Christine, Brother Sister Unique, Sister Judy. Um, this is Olive, but he says um, to the unmarried and to the widow. So if you are married and you are you un, are you single or you got married and you lost your spouse, um, it is good for them if, if they abide even as I. And I'm going to qualify that a little bit as we get into a little bit further in the text on the next time. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So Sister Judy says there that, and this is why context matters, but if they cannot contain, so what does he mean by if they cannot contain? What does that mean? If you can't what? If you can't, if you can't control yourself, if you find you having, Sister Unique said it, if you haven't, it's not even that you have to even um, do anything, but if you're even having thoughts, yeah. if you're doing all kind of thinking in your head, where I'm not sure, I like when people say, I was thinking in my head, like where else could you be thinking? <laughs> I just, I just, I like there's another place to think. All right, so if you're thinking um, then about stuff and you're thinking about relationships and you're thinking about this and that all the time, he says it's better to, for you to get married, and this is where Brother um, Brother Howard doesn't really agree because I understand his I understand his robbing the bank analogy. It's like he's saying, well, instead of robbing the bank, so he said it's like saying, okay, well, I can't control myself. I don't really want to get married, but I don't want. Sister Judy says I don't want to go to hell. I'd, I'd better to rob a bank than to go to hell. It's, I, I'm, I'm just mixing it, brother Brother Howard, with Sister Judy's response. So so what he's saying there is that. Um, it's, is it a real, is it a legitimate reason you're getting married, I think is what it is. Um, are you just doing it because you have an issue versus you really found somebody that is your, your person for life? Um, so in Sister Judy, let me just cut to the chase here. When he talks about that, it is more along the line what Sister Unique says. It is not that he says, if it's better to marry than to burn in hell. Well, yes, that is true. <laughs> but I don't, that's not the context. It, it needs to burn in your lust. Uh, 
That's what it means there, to have um, strong <laughs> passion. Okay, but yes, you're correct in the sense that if you, keep, if you keep lustful thoughts and you keep doing stuff, you're gonna burn in hell too. So both things are true, but the context there is that it is better to marry than to burn in your lust, right? If you have a lot of lustful thoughts and you're always thinking about sexual things and blah, 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 um, but you think you have, you, you, you want to be celibate. Let me just speak to the, to the young people, young men um, in church. If you're, if you're over 30 and you, have, and you have yourself together, you should probably get married unless you have the gift of celibacy. There are too many young people who, who are pretending um, that they are somehow, Paul is debunking all this stuff about you're more holy if you're, if you, um, if you're pretending that you can contain yourself. Um, most men do not have the gift of celibacy. If you don't have, unless you have the gift of celibacy, um, get married because you're just going to cause problems in the church and you're going to cause problems for yourself. So get married and stop playing around. And you're not super spiritual by not getting married. Um, you're, you're spiritual, uh, you're spiritual like we talked about um, through this whole 45 minutes or a little bit over an hour, uh, 45 minutes or a little bit over an hour that we've been here, um, that um, sexuality, um, spirituality and marriage are not separate and apart. They're all together and it all comes together in one. So he says here, if you cannot contain yourself, Get married, it's better to be married. It's, it's preferable that you're married rather than having a whole bunch of lustful thoughts, okay? So, so even, if, even if it's, you're robbing banks, um, even if you're full of lustful thoughts while you're robbing a bank, it's probably better. Go ahead, um, Sister Camille. All right, let me just go through this quickly. Paul's desire was that everyone could be celibate and unmarried as him. He was sensible enough to recognize that every man did not have his gift of continence. And when we say continence, that does not mean where it depends. What he's talking about is that he's sensible to recognize that every man does not have his gift of celibacy. Um, where celibacy does not exist naturally or by a miraculous intervention, marriage is the answer. So you, you will know if you have the gift of celibacy. I don't, I did not have that gift. So if you have that gift, keep it and stay that way because if you are unmarried and you're celibate, then you can attend to the things of God because you are less encumbered. When you are married, you have to take care of your wife. If you're a man, when you are married, you have to take care of your spouse, Sister Camille. Okay, so let me, get, let me finish up the last thing. And it's best to have the gift of continence or celibacy, but for those who cannot accomplish self-control, it's better to marry than to burn in unfulfilled desire. Nothing worse than unfulfilled desire. It is better to be married, better you be married, and, and when you get married, Sister Camille, you better have somebody with some good teaching um, that they're not teaching you that you should be celibate in marriage. Um, because that is separate and apart from what God has intended. You can go back to Genesis chapter 2 and start there, and you'll find the answer right there. Go ahead, honey. Question. Okay, I have Thought. two questions. Two I'm questions. what you just said. Um, I thought God wanted us to get married. Yes, he does. So then why did you say, like, if you have the gift of celibacy and you're okay with being celibate, then that's how you should stay? I love the way you think. It's very um, programmatic. I love it. It's like, it's like you're a program. I love it. All right. So what, what it means is that there are some people, right, who their purpose, that God deals with purpose. So there are some people whose purpose it is to just do a certain thing for God, and God sets those people apart. But for the general, the general will is for, it's for, for the command that was given in Genesis 2. Um, God gives Adam to Eve, I mean Eve to Adam, the two of them, he said, be fruitful, multiply, and what? Repopulate the earth. That was the command. For, and then he goes into, for this cause shall a man leave um, mother and father, shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he talks about the whole union, and the union together is to, is to come together so that they can um, be fruitful, multiply, populate the earth, and fulfill God's command that way. 
You can also fulfill, God also has a purpose in other people's lives, in, in people's lives also, to, to do a certain task. Marriage requires, now if I'm married to somebody, um, that my job now is to take care of my spouse. So we're going to get to it in the, if we get further on in the text, it's to take care of my spouse. I have to take care of her, so then I'm encumbered with that. When a person is single and celibate, they can focus on the things of God and, and fulfill this purpose that way. And there's also seasons in life too. There's seasons of celibacy when you're a single person coming up in the, in, in the kingdom. That's a whole season of your life that you can just fulfill God's purpose. And what Paul is saying, I was given this tremendous gift, just like all the gifts that God gives you. This gift that God gave him was to allow him now to just minister under the anointing to all these churches, help write books after books after books. He could not have possibly done all this if he was married. Couldn't. So God gave him that gift for that purpose, for that time. So he says, it's preferable, and I understand that this is a great gift that God gave me. I have now been separated from all these women. I don't have that desire for that. But what I am now doing is I have dev devoted all my time to serving God and to pushing forward his kingdom here on the earth. That both things are allowed in God's kingdom. Understand? Yes, no, babe. Okay, um, thank you. That was the first question. Uh-huh. I said that was the first question. Um, the okay. second question is mm -hmm. like, how is getting married supposed to magically rid you of lustful thoughts? Wouldn't you just have <laughs> lustful thoughts that you had before, but now you would just be acting on them, but they would still be there? Um, okay, so that's a good thing. So above all else, thine own self be true is by always my thing. So yes, I agree. But part of the, maybe if the, if the issue is you are having lustful thoughts um, to a woman that you are in love with, but you, you feel like, okay, I got to be celibate, then maybe it's better to marry her. And then you can do whatever you need to do and enjoy each other instead of lusting after other people. And also, when you are sexually fulfilled, then you don't necessarily have a whole lot of sexual um, thoughts or, or lustful thoughts, and hopefully your spouse can sexually fulfill you so that you don't have um, a lot of lustful thoughts. And also, those things are also things that you have to pray about too and get God to intervene if those things are still in your life and are still troubling you. So those are issues and areas that we still need prayer and we still need deliverance. And I agree with you, even in marriage, you have people who have lustful thoughts, even in marriage. But that's sinful. And that's what God is trying to get us to do now, is to focus and channel our energies on each other so that my sexual desires to my wife, okay, and her sexual desires are towards me and not to other um, people. But again, we're in flesh. We have this treasure. Second Corinthians, my favorite chapter. Second Corinthians 4. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. So we have an earthen body with all kinds of drama going on inside of it and all kinds of stuff going on outside of it. So we're pulled in all kinds of directions. But it, our mind has to be, we have to come back to God and we have to really want to serve God. And that's where it all begins, is what, what do you want to do? Do you really want to serve God? And when you start to say, I really want to serve God, then you find ways to channel your mind and make your mind do the right things. And we could spend a lot of time on that. That is a very good question. Um, and I haven't finished it yet, the answer to it. But I'd say in Ephesians, if, uh, Philippians, Philippians 4, Philipp, Philippians 3, Ephesians 4, those are good places to... Um, to look to those answers. Let me also read. I'm really sorry. Just one more question. What really? Was, really? What about if the woman doesn't want to get married and like you get married to somebody else and you still like that person? Say it again. Have, say it again. Like you said, if you have lustful thoughts for a woman, right? If you're a woman, uh-huh. Let's pretend I'm a man. Women don't have lustful thoughts. Let's pretend I'm a man, right? <laughs> yes, go I, ahead. Um, I have lustful thoughts for a woman. Yes. Because I like this woman. Yes. But I can't be with this woman. Mm -hmm. You said it's better if I just marry her. If you can, if she wants and to marry what you. what happens if she doesn't want to get married to me and I marry somebody else, but I still like her? Wouldn't I just have lustful thoughts for that woman? Uh, that you don't have to because you, you don't have to continue having the same thoughts all the time. <laughs> you can think about something else. Um, you know, there are probably... 
Um, and some of you men online, I'm not going to ask the men in here because there's only one, but <laughs> I'm not going to put anybody on the spot. But you, over the course of your life, you have liked lots of different people. Um, but there comes a time in life when you choose one person for whatever the reason is. Um, the feelings maybe you have for the other people probably are still there, but you now have one person in your life that you can focus your energies on and focus your time, your talents, and all your sexual desires and all your lustful thoughts and all those things. And over time, all those things, they sort of dissipate with time anyway. So you may feel like that initially, but you continue over time and you keep focusing on your spouse and your, your husband, your wife, your husband, your wife, those things, they kind of go away. Everybody has been in some relationship somewhere that you can still remember something. That's why Jamaican people say, too dry stick is if it catch fire. <laughs> Old fire what? Old fire would easy if it catch. I bet your sister Hardy knows that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they mean by that. Okay, well, so, and, and then the thing is, you. then the thing is, Sister Camille, in a practical sense, I, I love her. I love her question. I love her honestly. Um, is that you keep yourself from certain situations? Like if you know you have, let's say, me and Sister Unique had a thing, right? Then if I'm married to my wife, then me and Sister Unique. Guess what? We're not walking. We're not going to the movies together anymore, right? Because oh, what was that? Okay, so right, so that may, so you, you have to be wise. You keep yourself out of certain situations, and over time, those desires, they kind of fade with time. Make sense? I love your honesty. Yeah. Don't yeah. stop asking questions. Do not stop asking questions. All right, so let's go on. Thank you. Um, I like your humor, Minister Mark. I'm not going to read that because thank you for addressing the fact that I may have a headache. Just a scenario, Brother Earl. Anyway, they're having fun online. Um, Sister Carolyn Bell agrees with you. This is unique. I'm not sure at the point. Um, um, Sister Carol it was answering that question. It is better to stay single, but if you have strong sexual desires, then find, really what it speaks to is find somebody, is find somebody. And when you're, especially if you're a young man, um, and you are off the age and you got yourself together, if you still live in the basement with your mama, you're probably not ready to get married yet. <laughs> but um, um, if you are of age, you got yourself together, get married. Get married, get married and stop faking it. All right, so, um, so Paul's gift is to stay single, his desire is that everyone would be like him, but we are, we're each gifted differently. That's Sister Shelley J. Don't burn with passion, um, itch. If you can't quench your, your itch and passion, get married. That's Paul's gift and not mine, somebody said, <laughs> Sister Shelley. All right, and then Brother Earl, God made, made one command with Adam and Eve. Um, okay, I don't, sh not sure what he says there. Uh, okay, yes, Brother Mark, both are equally bad. Do not get married for the wrong reason. You'll not be able to undo it. If God has not given you that person, it won't work. Amen. Um, don't, we should talk about that. Um, does God give you a person or do you pick the person? You think God gives you a person? Okay. Um, so when you are single, you have more time. <clears throat> and get it favor from. But what do you do with the camels? That's weird. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That was he just, that was Rachel. That was, a, he was just looking for a sign, right? Right, so, okay. That's, so that's, that's, okay, so those are all different examples. And so those are not always, that's not always prescriptive. Those are examples, those are descriptive things. So you don't build a doctrine off of one descriptive thing. So that's not a, that's not a prescription, that's a description. Um, so, go ahead. I am reading, and I don't have Facebook because I don't actually get on Facebook. Um, but I don't have time. We're going to close out now. It is 8.54, and um, I didn't even know people were on Facebook, to be honest. I have never actually logged on to Facebook. Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. So I think I see 
Um, Brother Michael says, old fire stick, easy for catch. Okay. Kamisha Clark, love the questions, Sister Nikisha. I don't know what that means. I think that's just Nikisha asking on Sister Kamisha Clark's accounts. Um, <clears throat> Brother Lennon, I don't see his. Doctor? Huh? I don't see that. Hyattsville Corridor Community? All right. All right. Sex is one area of marriage. There are other things such as companionship, communication. Correct. Um, but Sister Lennon, we were only talking about sex tonight. <laughs> so let's skip for that. So we can, anytime you want to come and talk about communication, you're free to. I agree. It's more than that. Um, but yes, but we... Uh, you can't talk about all things at all times. So tonight we focused on one area, and I agree with Sister, Sister Lennon that there are other areas of marriage which we should also address at some time in the, and we have a couple's ministry here, we should probably do that in there. All right, so my time here is ended, and I have enjoyed my time here with you all. Are there any other questions, 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 questions? Uh, we got three, four minutes. I am going to ask someone to come out and close this in prayer. Or anybody who feels led tonight, you want to come out and just close this in prayer and do the benediction. Anybody tonight, I'm keeping it open. If not, I'm going to pick someone. One, two. Sister Judy, come. Sister, Sister Judy, no, you don't want to. You want to come just close this out. And close this out in prayer. All right, Sister Unique, come on, say hi. Right. Sister Unique's going to come close this in prayer and do the benediction. I want to first of all thank everybody for coming out and participating. All those online, you made it fun, you made it interesting. Um, go back and look at the uh, the broadcast if you can. Thank um, Sister Pauline for coming out, opening up everything. My sons for getting everything set up and getting the live stream. Thank you, for my readers, my people in the church. Outside, all you guys, Sister Camille, great questions, all those people online, everybody here, good answers and questions. All of you that are here, thank you so much for making this um, broadcast um, what it is. We're gonna, this time, please welcome um, Sister Yannick. All right. Father, we thank you um, for this another night that we have gathered together. We thank you, Lord God for your decree with marriages, Lord God. We ask, oh God, that we read your word for understanding, Lord God, that you will reveal to us the things that you would have us to do. Lord, we thank you for everything that you have done and communicated with us, Lord God. Thank you for your manservant, oh God, that you will pour into him Oh, God, as he teaches, Lord God, what your word says, Lord, and that we will live by your word. Lord God, even now we ask, oh, God, that in marriages, oh, God, that you will pull down the strongholds of the mind, oh, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask that you pull down the stronghold of the mind, oh, God, in the mighty name of Jesus, that we may come. Oh, God, and walk with you, Lord God, that you will lead us in the right path and keep us on the straight and narrow, oh God. We thank you, oh God, for your grace, your mercy, and your ever-loving kindness. Lord God, as we leave this place, oh God, but never from your presence, be with us, oh God. Bring us home safely, oh God, on the highways and the byways, oh God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now may the saving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rest, remain, and abide with, all, with us all now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, guys. Praise God. I missed half of this session. Hmm?